the cost of carry model gives us an approach to calculating the theoretical forward price of a commodity. I'd first like to explain how it works, why it works, and then briefly walk through five examples from John Hall to show you that they are all compatible with the same cost of carry model. To understand the cost of carry model, I think it helps to imagine that we are here today at time zero, and our goal is to own or hold the commodity in the future, let's say at the end of a period denoted by capital T. With that goal, we have two ways to go. Basically, we could simply purchase the commodity today at the spot price, and the spot price is the price at which we can agree to buy or sell an asset immediately or almost immediately. And then we would just hold on to the commodity until we get to the point in time in the future at which we need it. And so we could also say that we would carry that commodity over the period. So cost of carry is really cost of ownership of the commodity. Our other choice is to avoid current ownership by entering into a long futures contract, a futures or a forward contract. And in a futures or forward contract, recall that's probably the simplest type of derivative contract. Here we have an agreement in the case of a long position to buy the commodity at a future point in time that we'd have agreed upon and also at a predetermined price. So that forward contract is an agreement to buy in the future at a predetermined price. So the F sub zero here is significant. I'm following John Hall's notation because in the case of the long, we're gonna pay this in the future, but it's an agreed upon or for a futures contract, it's an observable traded price today. So we don't do a discounting of that price. It's a price today, but we're gonna pay it in the future. So what is that price? Well, to get the what we call the theoretical futures or forward price, the most common model is the cost of carry model. And the idea is, the idea is pretty simple. It's simply that if we're going to avoid ownership of the commodity in the meantime, and we're going to be paying the forward or futures price in the future, we ought to expect to pay whatever it costs to buy the commodity today and then own or carry it in the meantime. So that's the cost of carry and the cost of carry is denoted small c. Again, I'm using John Hull's notation, but there's nothing magical about that. And so there is a cost to carry this commodity, which would grow this price here in the meantime. And it's in the exponent as C times T over the period, which of course indicates that we're using, we're assuming continuously compounded. And so this cost of carry, I would emphasize though, is a net cost of carry. That's because ownership is not just a cost, but it can also be a benefit, which gives rise to here, the key distinction between investment commodities and consumption commodities. So both are commodities, but an investment commodity, for example, foreign exchange or a foreign currency, I should say, but also the S&P 500 index are examples of investment commodities. They have a borrowing cost and borrowing is the most significant cost in the cost of carry. It applies to both investment and consumption. And that's why I have it in red as a cost in the cost of carry. And the idea is that anyone who needs to buy the commodity today needs to borrow money in order to buy the commodity. Even if you don't go out and take out a loan or borrow explicitly, there's an opportunity cost to those funds. So the borrowing cost is fundamental to the cost of carry. And in John Hull, we'll denote it with R, standing for the risk-free rate. So R as the risk-free rate is the common ingredient in the cost of carry that would apply to either commodity because anybody needs to borrow or they have the opportunity cost of funds if they purchase the commodity immediately. 
for an investment commodity, there may also be income or dividend. And of course, if you carry or own the commodity, that's a benefit. So it offsets the borrowing. That's why I have it in green. So our net cost of carry here would be borrowing on the one hand, but offset or reduced by income on the other. The consumption commodity is a little different. Again, corn being an example of a consumption commodity. And by the way, we can have commodities that are both investment and consumption, so it's not mutually exclusive. The classic example is silver. But in the case of a consumption commodity like corn or oil or copper or wheat for that matter, we will have the borrowing cost. Anyone who buys that commodity today incurs at least the opportunity cost of borrowing, but they will have to store the commodity in the meantime. That's the big difference between a futures or forward contract and owning the commodity by a spot purchase immediately. The big difference for a consumption commodity is it needs to be stored in the meantime. Hence, storage cost is the non-trivial cost that gets included with a consumption commodity. However, there may be a convenience, on the other hand, to store owning and storing that commodity, so that's an offset. More on consumption commodities later. Here, I'm only interested in this video in the cost of carry model as it pertains to investment commodities. And then I've denoted borrowing costs with R for the risk-free rate and the income. We're going to follow Hall and use a capital I if we can reduce it to a lump sum. If not, and if it happens, if it's something that we need to represent with a dividend yield, for example, we're going to follow John Hall, not use a small I because that's used, that has other uses, but we'll use the small Q. Okay, so that's the basic idea. C is the net cost of carry, which would include any of the factors that apply in terms of a cost, the most significant being borrowing, but also any offsets in the other direction that are benefits of ownership, which would include, in the case of investments, an income. Now I'll walk through five examples in John Hall, starting from basic to a little more sophisticated, that show how all of the examples are compatible with the same template, our cost of carry model. In the first example, the idea is there is a four-month forward contract to buy a zero-coupon bond, and that bond has a spot price of $930, and we're told finally that the risk-free rate of interest, continuously compounded, is 6% per annum. The risk-free rate of interest being continuously compounded is convenient because it fits directly into our cost of carry model, which is in continuously compounded terms, but of course has a discrete analog that I'm not showing. And so this example is simple because the only cost of carry factor is the borrowing rate or the risk-free rate. And the theoretical futures price then is going to be our spot price of 930 multiplied by E raised to our 6%, I'll use decimal form, multiplied by four months, but divided by 12 months per year because the exponential here, the exponent, is in per annum terms, right? R is the risk-free rate per annum, and T is the number of years. So we want to use 6% as the per annum rate, but multiply it by the number of years, which in this case is one-third of a year. And so we have a theoretical futures price of $948.79, and it's the cost of carry model, but our only cost to carry is the risk-free rate of interest. Okay, so next example adds one variation, and otherwise we have the same example. It's a forward contract to buy a zero-coupon bond, although now it's a nine-month forward contract as opposed to the four-month four contract here. And the one bit difference here is that this is not a zero-coupon bond. It's a coupon bond. Whoops, two... Um, it's a coupon bond that pays $40 after four months, but the spot price and risk-free rate are the same. So we still have the same 
cost of carry model, but the owner of the bond is going to receive the coupon of $40. And that's not really a cost of ownership, but a benefit of ownership. So it's going to be subtracted from the spot price here. The key idea is that we want to discount this 40 to the present value, today's present value, so it's in the same time dimension as the current spot price. So you see spot price minus the lump sum of any income or dividends received. And so here we can see that straightforward. We just take the $40 and discount it at the same 6% over the four months that it's going to be received in. That 39.21 is subtracted in the cost of carry. So otherwise, we have the same template and our theoretical futures price then is going to be given by $930 minus the $39.21. And that itself is going to be raised to, I want to run out of space here, 0 0.06 times the, uh, that's a 6% interest rate times the 0.75 years. Third example, we have a 10 month forward contract on a stock when the stock price is $50. The risk free rate of interest this time is 8% per annum. And now this stock pays three dividends at three, six, and nine months of 75 cents per share each. Okay, so general template, and still we apply the cost of carry where our risk-free rate of interest is the only cost of carry factor, but we're going to, to, to subtract the lump sum of all the dividends paid. So in similar fashion, can't, can't see all the way over to the left here, but all we're doing is discounting all three dividends to into the lump sum income. So we know we have a 75 cent dividend that's going to be received or we discount at 0 0.8, 0 0.8, and that's going to be received in three months, right? So that's negative 8% times three divided by 12 is discounting from at three months over 8%, the 75 cents. That's the first dividend. We would add the second dividend, which is at the same 8%, but that's going to be received in six months. And finally, the third dividend, and that's going to be received in a negative 0 0.08 in nine months. And the total of that is the 216. Lump sum benefit of ownership is subtracted from the spot price and then we just use the risk-free rate in the cost of carry template. And we get a theoretical forward price of $51.14. Okay, fourth example among five, only two more to go. Here we have six month forward contract on an asset that's expected to provide income equal to 2% of the asset price once during a six month period. So this is also 4% per annum with semi-annual compound frequency. The asset price is $25 and the risk-free rate is 10%. So here we can use the version of the cost of carry model where now the cost of carry has two factors, the borrowing cost of R, the risk-free rate, and we would subtract the, in this case, the income received but instead of treating it as a lump sum, we've been given enough information to convert it into its continuous equivalent. And it's subtracted because again, just like we subtracted the lump sum, that would be a benefit of ownership. So it subtracts in the cost of carry model. So now you can see the cost of carry model in this scenario, the cost of carry is R minus Q. And we're here, We've just converted a 4% per annum with semi-annual compounding into its continuously compounded equivalent, which is almost 4%, pretty close to 4%. In fact, you wouldn't be totally 
off to use 4%, but we're but Hull is very specific. We have the 3.96, and then you can see it plugs into the cost of carry model. Also, very conveniently, because we are going to use the spot price of $25, and we're going to multiply it by that E raised to the risk-free rate of interest, 0 0.10, that's my open parens, but I'm going to subtract the dividend yield, so 0 0.0396, and then I'm going to multiply that difference by the maturity of 0 0.5 years, and that'll give me the $25.77 as the theoretical price of the forward contract. And the final example is similar, but this time it's not a forward, but a futures contract. So that means it's exchange traded. It's a three-month futures contract on an index where the stocks on the underlying index pay a dividend yield of 1% per annum. And we're given the current index value. That's really the spot price and a risk-free rate. So in this case, we the dividend yield is 1% per annum already given to us in continuously compounded return, um, terms such that our application of the cost of carry model again is pretty straightforward because for financial or investment commodities, the cost of carry is generally R minus Q. So in this case, we're gonna take the spot price of 1300 multiplied by E raised to the difference between the risk-free rate of 5% and the dividend yield of 1%. And that difference will get multiplied by the maturity of three months or 0.25 years. Gives us the theoretical forward price. So all five examples, all instances of the same cost of carry template. And now you can see that for investment commodities, as opposed to consumption commodities, the cost of carry can in general be represented by the cost of borrowing, the risk-free rate, which is the risk-free rate minus the income or dividend, if we can express it this way in continuously compounded terms. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel and you'll be informed of our updates. Thank you.